Hello, Miriam, and welcome to my YouTube channel. Miriam, I just want to say thank you so much for coming on here. And if you want to share with us how the Jehovah's Witnesses came into your life and your story as Jehovah's Witness. Thank you very much. And thank you for this forum, forum because I think it's like really an empowering thing for people to have a place where they can tell their unique story. Um, I also think that um, probably we may have had a lot of similar experiences, but we all experience the religion in a different way. So I appreciate the chance to get to talk about me a little bit and my experience. Um, so I was born to Jehovah's Witnesses parents. Um, and it, so my parents' conversion story is how, how I came um, to be a witness. Um, my parents were um, baby boomers. So they were born after World War II and they grew up in the rural South. So my dad is originally from a small town in Georgia, my mom from a very small town in Alabama, and they met in college. And so I think at the time they were dating, and I think my maternal grandmother started studying first, and so then they sat in on that, and I think there was this young um, witness who came to their dorm and would study with them, and so they um, got baptized two weeks before they got married. And then, um, but they stayed on to finish college and um, they had me while they were still students in college, right? So I was born um, in um, rural Alabama. And I think it's important to, to mention that their experience was um, pretty unique because that meant that they grew up um, black in, in those small towns. So at the time when there were, you know, black and white water fountains, um, they only went to segregated schools their entire lives. As a matter of fact, I'm the first person in my family, the first generation to go to an integrated or desegregated school all 12 years. So it's it was um, it was very real. And I think that for me personally, the way I experienced the witnesses has a lot to do with race and with my gender. Right. My experiences, that was an important part. Um, and I say that because after college, they came back to my dad's hometown in Georgia, small town. And a lot of people. Um, younger people, when they talk about witnesses, they always talk about, you know, the spiritual paradise, right? All races living together in unity. But the reality was a little different because so we we were back and by this time, I guess it's like early 70s. And so I remember, I mean, I'm in my 50s. I'm not that old. And I remember going to segregated kingdom halls. There was a white kingdom hall. There was a black kingdom hall. Um, there were assemblies where there was a line down the middle and black set on one side and white set on the other side, right? So that was my experience, early experience with witnesses. As a matter of fact, some of my earliest memories are of a kingdom hall bill. And this is long before there were quick bill halls. This was a kingdom hall bill that was intended to last for several months, if not greater part of a year when I was a tiny kid, um, maybe just before I started school. And um, it was meant so that the black witnesses and the white witnesses would learn to work together and send in building that hall. And then it was the first integrated kingdom hall. They also wanted to make sure nobody would bomb it. <laughs> so it was the first integrated kingdom hall in LaGrange, Georgia. Um, and so that was that. So, I mean, the, the, we'd like to believe that, oh, so then they all dwelt in unity. But er, all of uh, witnesses don't necessarily teach you how to root out deep-seated bias or implicit bias. Um, it's just a pretty picture. And so my experience was was um, like behind the scenes. I got to see what it was like when they first integrated. These are the first time that white people and black people are meeting together. And so it was there were a lot of like microaggressions. There were a lot of anxiety. My dad was sort of the darling because he became an elder very early on and he was articulate and well-spoken, which is what they always say for a person who's an educated black person, right? And so um, because of that, he became an elder and he was chosen to give talks. But I mean, he even, I remember going to the White Kingdom Hall for him to give talks. And I remember afterward, the microaggressions of what people would say to him and how irritated they would be in the car. I remember going, we would be in, you know, visiting, he would be the visiting speaker and they would go, sometimes they would only, the watch our conductor would only call on white people to comment, right? And not call on blacks. That would be an anxiety. One time my mom, we were, my dad was a visiting speaker and she went to a neighboring congregation and she had on a dress that a white sister thought was too nice. So she grabbed the collar of it to look at the <laughs> label. And my mom was really angry. So there were all of these microaggressions. 
Um, it was also very different because growing up in the city of LaGrange, Georgia was a very unique city. It's called a company town. So there were rich family who owned a lot of things and because that were for public use. So what that meant was that when everyone else desegregated, um, LaGrange didn't. So that meant I, I went to school, you know, I graduated in the late 1980s. Um, there were segregated swimming pools. There was segregated library until 1996. <laughs> so it lasted. So it was a very real part of my childhood. And this is really odd. So what that means is imagine you're a teenager, right? And you got a carload of kids going in field service together, white kids and black kids. And we're, you know, it's already hard enough, right? It was already hard enough to go to people's doors and hope you don't meet a classmate, that sort of thing. And then they, you know, it's really sweltering hot in the summertime. Like we were all auxiliary pioneering, trying to get our time in. And then they say, oh my God, it's so hot. You know what? We want to go to the pool and cool off. Miriam, we got to drop you out of home because it was be the white only pool, right? And so nobody thought that there was anything wrong with that because it was a part of the way that people lived. There were, um, as a matter of fact, I remember a very, my mom had, had a habit of if someone came to the Kingdom Hall and they, you know, they they were alone or they were new and no one, they didn't know anybody there, we try to have them over for for lunch. And so there was this white brother that we had over and he said, um, he came in at lunch with us and he said that his job was, he was thinking of taking a job in our city. And he said that uh, he had come here, he had come to the city and he had seen a realtor and they wanted to, you know, sell, sell my house. And he said, there's no way I could raise my family here. I've never seen anything like this. He said, the realtor told me this is a good neighborhood. You can be sure there'll never be any black people living next to you. Like that was the thing they said. He said, and they took him to places like these are the white pools. So these are the nice places you could. Sit. And he said, I can't live here. I can't have that kind of prejudice around my kids. And I remember being maybe about 10 or 11. I remember thinking, well, why don't any of the people here, why don't the friends of the congregation have a problem with that? You know, why do they all think it's okay? Here's a witness from another area from the North. And he thought this was horrific and he never wanted to come here again. So it was, it was weird to see that from various viewpoints. But I think it's important that that's the backdrop that I experienced, um, you know, the religion. Personally, that meant too that um, I felt like all the time growing up, there was a spotlight on my family. Um, so we were, you know, elders kids, we, there were four of us, and the reality was a lot different than it looked. We were the Huxable family, if <laughs> like the early Cosby family, right? That was the persona. Um, but the reality was, you know, my mom had emotional highs and lows. Um, she had postpartum depression that she was dealing with after the kids. Um, she tried to pioneer even when she shouldn't have, like it wasn't really conducive. It was very stressful for her. Um, and my dad, we, you know, financial problems. So he was working multiple jobs most of my childhood. He was hardly ever there. So between multiple jobs and uh, trying to carry out congregation responsibilities, a lot fell on my mom. And then she put a lot on me as an older child. So I was babysitting since age eight. You know, we always, but we always had to be at the meetings on time. We had to be studied for the meetings. You know, we had to go in field service. If you were out of school for a summer, you got auxiliary pioneer time. Um, we were supposed to pioneer as soon as we graduated. This was understood. So it was a lot of pressure. And then it made it so that, you know, so I had the typical witness issues where I go to school and it's so hard not celebrating birthdays and not celebrating holidays. And you just, you know, and you're supposed to proselytize all the time. And who wants to hear that? So I stood out as being different that way. But then it was just as hard inside of the congregation because um, there are a lot of kids who are doing different things, right? So nobody wants the, you know, elder's kid who's supposed to be the shiny, happy elder's kid if they're dating a really guy, right? Or if they're doing something they thought I would narc on them. So it was like really hard for me to fit in that way. And then sometimes I'd have what I called pretend friends because, you know, I'd have like a, my dad would have a, he was a district and a circuit um, convention speaker. So he'd always, you know, put his kids on to talk about how well we were doing. And so parents would sometimes send their teens to come over and associate with me and the teens were like oh, they would do it but just because they could get away with doing anything with this elder's daughter right if they were if they said they were going with me then it was okay for them to hang out so there was a lot of that and it made it um very difficult to negotiate identity formation as an adolescent so it's like the backdrop of dealing with race prejudice the backdrop of dealing with 
the demands of the organization. It just, you know, it, it was it was difficult. But there were pockets of fun too. I mean, I got to be in some about three or four district assembly dramas. I enjoyed that. Um, I worked about three jobs at one point and saved up money to go to a uh, um, international assembly. And I got to go to Prague back when it was actually Czechoslovakia and um, tour Europe. So that was that was fun. It would have been great if I didn't have to do all the, the things that the tour said I had to do if I had gotten to truly have that experience as a tourist. But, you know, it wasn't all drudgery. There was that. But um, field service was always difficult for me. Um, I always had anxiety, often had panic attacks. I didn't even recognize what they were at the time. Um, I was very, I understood that, you know, very much that the people didn't want me there and why they didn't want me there and how insulting some of the things that we were taught to say was, you know, basically about their religion. And so that was always something that was difficult for me. Um, and so my escape was always reading. I read absolutely everything. Books were my, you know, that was my world. I lived, I was such a nerd. Um, and so I, I escaped through books. I also read all of the witness literature, right? I read older male volumes and I used to always be disturbed by a lot of things that I read. Um, for instance, the, the way that the friends were treated in Malawi, you know, that was always because we were always supposed to pray for these African brothers and sisters who were having horrible things happen to them. And that's why later it became a very visceral experience. I remember reading about that and worrying about that as a kid. And then I got older and read Crisis of Conscience and read, oh, well, the friends of Malawi were having to go through all of this persecution, but yet they were, because they couldn't buy a party card because the Watchtower Bible Drag Society said they weren't supposed to buy one, but yet in other countries, they let them do that, right? And, and, they, and a former governing body member said, yeah, that wasn't, they weren't treated fairly at all. And so it helped me later, I realized that's because um, there's not, I, I was a part of a white centered male dominated organization, right? That's the mindset. Um, it's if they're only, you know, governing body member, there's only one of color and in a hundred years, <laughs> then that means that perspective is gonna, is gonna be the perspective that they see things. That's their lens in which they see the world. And so that was, that's something that took a while for me to understand. Um, but as a teenager, um, one of the problems with excelling in school and making good grades is that, you know, then you're encouraged to go to college. And so that was a, I think that was maybe the first time I started to think, you know, I really want to do something very different from what I'm supposed to. I would love to go to college. Um, I, I wanted to learn. I wanted that experience. And so um, I even had a guidance counselor who would have me, um, Mr. Brantley, would bring me in and talk to me about college and he would listen to I've got to be you know like a missionary only not a missionary I got to be a pioneer and it made no sense to him for me either but he would um he he even applied for scholarships for me you know and I received some of them and he would give so he would apply for a scholarship call me in his office and I get this is the 80s no no internet but he gave me the glossy brochure right and I take it and I hide it under my bed and I remember um, I was interviewed because of my grades. I was inducted into Society of Distinguished High School Students. And they asked me, um, like, what do you want to be? What profession? And all I could think is, I'd love to be like, you know, the Cosby Show, Claire Huxtable. She's a lawyer. And I thought she was amazing. And the people on LA Law, and I'd love to be a lawyer. And then they wrote that in there. And I thought, I can't show that to anybody that I wanted to be a lawyer. So that went under my bed, right? And so um, I remember thinking, I, I don't think I had a, a real plan. I was like, how can I talk to my parents about this? And my mom found the stash under my bed. And she and she told me basically, no uncertain terms. If you think we're not going to help you apply to college, if you think you're going to do that, it's going to be an embarrassment to the family. You will leave our house with the clothes on your back. That'll be all that you have. That terrified me because I had no job, no way to support myself. So I knew that that was a non-starter. I would not be doing that. So I graduated with honors and I started working odd jobs. I worked in retail, I worked at a daycare um, and I pioneered and it took a while. I think I finally got enough to even buy a car to pioneer with um, when I was um, working for a UPS packaging company when I was like maybe about 19. Um, but I only worked part time. I never had enough money. I, it took money to pioneer. So I only had enough money to go in field service and keep up my car. Never had enough money to pay rent or do any of those other things. And I never developed any marketable skills, right? It was always just whatever odd jobs were hiring. 
but it was never a career track. It was never anything that I could um, that I could do well and support myself. So there was that. And then, so I did what the most um, good witness girls do. You find a husband, right? If you can't do that and you want to get out of your parents' house. So I married the first guy who asked me. And he's, you know, we had grown up together. We had known each other since we were 12. Knew that he was pioneering. He was a ministerial servant. So it was, you know, a great match. Although I think it's a very weird experience dating when we were witness because, you know, I was still the shiny elder's daughter. So um, the minute two people, rumors fly that they are kind of attracted to each other, then spotlight is really on them. And so what that meant is that anytime we went somewhere, it had to be a group of people. We had to, so <laughs> basically my parents would send a sibling with us. So we didn't even have any time alone, right? So that was the dating experience that we had no time alone. We were always there with a brother or sister. And it was almost as if, and then we had a big kingdom hall wedding where, you know, as soon as, you know, he proposed and my parents took over the wedding planning. So it was the entire congregation was invited. And I look at that. I don't think I had very many decisions to make. It was what my parents chose. So, you know, because that's the goal. You you take a girl and you marry her off to someone and then, you know, your job is done. Then she's safe, right? Taken care of. So I went from my parents, I went from day bed in my parents' house to my husband's house, right? And I remember thinking that during those times, how great it would be to have choices. Like my little brother, you know, went to Bethel. And I thought, wow, to be able, to, and he seemed to be building some kind of a life for himself with new friends and stuff. I remember thinking how, how horrible it was that I, and I even applied to Bethel and they laughed at me because what, you can babysit kids. There's not right, really anything we can do there. So there were no choices. I felt like I was in a box, right? There was no there were no choices. All of the decisions had been made for me. And I was handed, I was handed, one man handed me off to another man to take care of. And then I was his problem. And there was that. So um, we even, and even, it was almost as if we got to know each other once we got married, because that was the only time we spent any time alone. And I mean, you know, we were friends. Um, but I think we, we also understood that our parents were too deeply involved in our lives. They were still telling us stuff to do, like, you know, you know, how are you spending your money and making sure that you, you know, get your hours in Pioneer and, and, and it was getting really, so we went to serve where the need was greater in a neighboring Alabama town. This was, we were in Georgia. We went across the state line and we started just so we could have some kind of autonomy. Only, you know, being kids, we went and we bought a house in this really economically depressed place where there are even fewer jobs and even less economic opportunities because, you know, that's where the need was greater. That's why in a really rural congregation. Um, so all of the problems that we had in our home congregation were exacerbated. Race prejudice was exacerbated, lack of economic opportunity and no marketable skills. So um, I about I got pregnant and had my first daughter um, about three, four years after we married. And I think that's when I started, and when she was a toddler, my then husband lost his job. And so then we were in a tailspin, right? And I realized this, this isn't cool. And it was, I, I remember holding her and thinking about the promises that I made for her that she would have better choices than I did. My daughter would not have the same restrictions put on her. She could have the career she wanted. I didn't care what anyone said. She was going to be able to have opportunities, you know, to find herself, to, you know, figure out who she was. Um, and I had no idea how I was going to fulfill those promises to her. But that was a time when I actually started to think about my own life and the limited choices that I had. So much so, we went undercover to a community college, right? Because we realized we were applying for jobs left and right, and there was nothing. So we went undercover. And I think about that experience. So this would have been the late 90s. And, um, you know, we're in a rural Alabama town in a community college. So this is not like the best you know degree program you can be in and we took all of the courses that you take during your first two years of college where you take the English and the you know the science and the math and everything um and we did it in the evenings whenever we could we would sometimes like at this point we'd stop pioneering but there was still work there's still meetings and all that so we had our daughter we'd pass her off you go to class and then I'll go to class and you you know and that was the way we were trying to fit in a schedule so it was really tight and difficult but the one class that we that was like an eye opener was history of Western civilization, because this is the first time that I had actually studied the events, historical events that take place in the Bible, not using the witnesses literature. <laughs> and it was like, so you have a bunch of people who were like, oh, this is a required class and it's so boring. 
And I was riveted. I was like, wait a minute. So you mean there was maybe another explanation between the parting of the Red Sea and the sun standing still? Wait, 607 BCE wasn't the date? <laughs> So and like every time I was like, we would come back and compare notes. Like, did you hear what she said? It would be rocking our world because I was supposed to be a great student, but I realized how skewed everything that I knew, like everything I knew about history was like, I had learned it in this bubble and I had studied all the witnesses publications. So I knew the trajectory of what they were teaching about 1975 and all that stuff. But like, it was, I didn't understand this is objective fact. I had never um, put it against any anything that could actually be a critical analysis. And so that was the start of thinking, that is wild. Like, really, there's another way of looking at that. But there's a lot of cognitive dissonance with being a witness anyway. So what you do is when things like just don't make sense and they needle at you and you just kind of push it back. And so that's what I was doing. And there was a lot going on in my life. So I pushed it back. Um, but then it became time for my daughter to go to school, and I realized I didn't want her to go into school there, and we had reached a limit. We couldn't do any better financially where we were. My brother had come out of Bethel at that point, and he and his wife were living in Maryland uh, near the D.C. area, and there were just so many more jobs and so many more opportunities, and so we, we, you know, my husband and I at that time, we talked about it, and we are like, we got to get out of here. So we just start, all we had was dial up. And so we, I just started applying for jobs for us everywhere, just applying. And we happened to get jobs in North Carolina. So we got here, we came here before my daughter started first grade. And actually we came here about three weeks before 9-11, North Carolina. And so we, and we literally packed everything we had in the back of a U-Haul and just took off because we knew there had to be something better for us. We just weren't doing well where we were. Um, and so doing that, um, I look back and I see these were pivotal moments in my life and my journey. Um, now, keep in mind when we got here, you know, my then husband was still an elder. We were still had all these other responsibilities, but people didn't know us enough to um, to get into our business quite as much. You know, we didn't. And so at at a certain point, I started doing other things. I took some creative writing courses because I always wanted to be a writer. I love writing poetry. I love writing short stories. And one of the best decisions I ever made in my life, serendipity really, um, was I went to Salem College in went to Salem, North Carolina. And this is the oldest woman's college in America, right? And not that I knew that. And I went just to go, went in one day to find out some information about a writing contest. And there was a woman there who was a dean of continuing ed students. And her goal was to try to get women back into school, right, and finish their education. And I just got, I talked to her and she made it really easy for me to apply for college and financial aid. As a matter of fact, her name was Alice. And it was almost as if you could do this without knowing that you were, it wasn't this whole process. She just asked you a few questions and let's get you in to audit some classes. And so I started going to Salem College um, and working it around work schedule, childcare, meeting responsibilities, field service. But here I am trying to finish my last two years of my college degree. But Vivian, going there was like the most amazing thing for me. And it was such an empowering experience because that's when it dawned on me that I had never seen women in this role before, right? This is a college for women run by women. There are women doing maintenance and maintenance crews. There's a woman who's a president of a college, everything in between. My tenure professors, all women. So on the one hand, I was seeing what women could be, right? When they weren't weaker vessels, <laughs> when they weren't told from childhood that they had to be submissive. And it was comparing what was going on from the platform with what I was seeing. And it's like, you know, I was in my early 30s at this point, and there would be this searing discussions about who, you know, skirts being worn too short and a quiet and mild spirit. And I saw how little autonomy we had over our lives and our bodies and our choices. And yet I go to class and I hear these women talk about living and examine life and the sky's the limit and what do you want to be? And so um, there was that dichotomy. And I think I, I, I wrote about this, um, I think a pivotal experience. So I had to write an honors thesis as part, I was an English major and I had a mentor that I had to meet with. And I was also supposed to, from the platform, we were supposed to increase our time and field service. So I thought, 
Well, I'll just witness to her. And I remember having an Awake magazine I was going to share with her in our session where we were going over my thesis. And I remember thinking this whole process of, you know, we're talking about this. And my professor that I love so much, one of the things she would say whenever she's there, she's like, your mind is like a sponge. I have never met a student who wanted to learn as much as you did. What do you want to do after college? And I thought, well, I don't know, maybe I'll teach her something. Right? And she goes, why are you having trouble thinking bigger? Is what she would ask me every time. You're not thinking big enough. And I remember, well, I've never, I've never. No one ever cared about what I wanted to be, who I wanted to be, what I could achieve. That was pretty much all handed to me. And I literally remember taking the Awake magazine out and like looking at it. I was supposed to witness to her and I already planned it. And I thought, why would I want this woman to come to the convention? Why would I want her to be so small? She had the most amazing life experiences. She taught me things I couldn't even have imagined. She taught me critical analysis and how to write, you know, properly in an academic setting. And I'm thinking, why would I want her to come and be told? And I slid it back in my bag, like like the, the, my backpack, like, I don't want to do that. I don't just, I don't, you know, I don't want to do that. And so I look at, that was a pivotal moment. Um, it was also interesting around this time, my, my then husband was having his own problems and he was disfellowship. That was his journey, his, his story. But the, the reason that played for me is because suddenly I wasn't an elder's wife, right? I wasn't an elder's daughter. And the thing is, for most women like that, we then in the congregation would become the problem women. You know, the woman that, you know, the, oh, don't, you know, woman trying to raise her kid with an unbelieving spouse or, or single mom or whatever. All of a sudden, we're the elder's problem and not there. And so it's really easy to be under the radar for the first time because the man in charge of me that I was an appendage of wasn't in the spotlight. And my, any status that I had in the congregation was simply attached to the man in charge of me. It had absolutely nothing to do with me. So he wasn't an elder anymore. People weren't watching me up for, you know, every step I made, I didn't have to be at the meetings at this particular time. I didn't have to make sure my child was dressed well. I didn't have to get every Saturday to make sure I was there for field service. No one cared whether I commented or not. I didn't have to have a watch child lesson study. And it was like, the relief. Oh my God, the relief. And so then I started thinking about my future. And so one of the things uh, we were in a meeting again, what do you want to be? Think bigger, Miriam. And I thought, you know, I had that book that was buried under my bed. And what I really wanted was to be a lawyer, but that was 12, 13 years ago. And that's crazy, right? And she goes, that's not crazy at all. Why don't you apply? And I thought, no, that's crazy. I mean, I couldn't do that. That's and she's like, why don't you apply? So I applied to law school and I got in with a scholarship. And so <laughs> that was my next journey. And so then I went to law school. Um, and at this point, I had actually faded, right? At this point, I, I realized this is not, it was that it was faith deconstruction. I didn't really have a model to follow. Um, I had joined some online groups. And so I knew that there were other people's experiences. Um, I had read Crisis of Conscience by, you know, Ray France, because I, you know, read everything. And that was interesting. And another thing that really em was empowering to me is Barbara Anderson, her experience. Um, and I, I, you know, as a woman, and it was, it, it really resonated with me because I can remember in the early nineties, I was an elder's wife. I'm in that small Alabama congregation. And I remember the most empowering, it was this Awake magazine. And there was Watchtower Magazine about women worthy of honor. It was like in the early 90s. And I remember I have never read Watchtower article that was so friggin' empowering. Like it, it made me think about the women, who, you know, women who were forgotten in the Bible, right? Who were just footnotes. And then to realize Barbara Anderson wrote that when she was on the writing committee. And not only had she written those articles, which is why there was a noted difference in the tone and the tenor of those articles and anything that I ever read, and I'd read everything, was because um, that to find out that she said there were women who wrote anonymously to her at when she was at Bethel saying, oh, that changed my life, but they could, but I'm an elder's wife and I don't want to sign this. I don't want it to cause, you know, and I thought that is really telling. Here's the one time that we read something that was empowering and we couldn't shout it from the rooftops we realized that our place was marginalized and that drawing any attention would have problems for the man in charge of us. Because bottom line, that's all our role was to make them look good. 
If you're a kid, if you're a woman, if you're a woman, you're a perpetual child, right? Someone has to always take care of you. But the job is to make them look good so they can show they're presiding over their household in a fine manner, right? That's that's what our role was. And so the, the backdrop of that, so that was a huge part of my faith deconstruction. So at this point, I'm attending law school. And um, we moved to another city in North Carolina for law school for me specifically. Um, and, you know, um, had to make a lot of changes, flexibility. It was grueling three years. It was a lot of demands that were being made. Um, and I kind of shelved the faith deconstruction. I had faded, but I didn't have time to really process any of that. I had been, you know, I really had to do this. And we were investing a lot of money into getting me ready for a career. The other thing that was pivotal that happened is that um, it was a, I was a charter or member of a law school. So that was mean, that meant I was the first class. It was a university that developed a new law school. I was in the first class and it was in a downtown urban area. Two blocks away was a, um, a legal aid, which was provided free civil legal services to um, people who couldn't afford it. Um, and things like mortgage foreclosure and domestic violence protection and and public benefits and a lot of other things, housing issues, eviction problems. And so one of the jobs that I had, had when we moved to North Carolina was helping people apply for Medicaid, right, for medical coverage. And I got an informational interview and I went and met the managing attorney there and said, you know, is there any way I can intern here or help out in any way? And she goes, yeah, if you know something about Medicaid, that's a hard thing to know. And so they brought me on and I realized who I was and what my purpose was. My purpose, I really did enjoy law school because it was a lot of wealthy kids, a lot of kids who had, had everything handed to them. A lot, you know, it, I just didn't, it did, and they were younger than I was. It just didn't, you know, it wasn't a, a place where I felt at home. But when, when I realized what I was learning could be put to use for these people, mostly women who were in vulnerable position, and positions and I could be their voice, that was a career for me. That's what I knew. That's what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. I was almost 40 when I figured it out, but I figured it out, right? That's what I wanted to, to do with my life. And so I literally came on there as an intern and I worked there. And then I worked as an extern there. I worked as a law clerk there. Basically, I stayed there until they gave me an actual attorney job when I graduated. Um, and I I loved what I was doing because I knew what it felt like to be powerless and to be voiceless and not to really understand the way the world worked. And I figured if I could help somebody who could, you know, if I could be a voice for them and if I could help them, that was something that made me feel the most powerful I'd ever felt in my life. And it was the first time I'd ever had a chance to feel like the the things, the values that I truly had, that, that was matching with what I did Monday through Friday, right? That had never happened. Um, I had never had that opportunity. So I literally was an attorney there um, from the time I, well, I started as an intern and I didn't leave until 2020. So that was about 14 years that I worked there. And that was great. Um, and I left because by that time though, I had gotten a divorce and um, I had to support, a, I had another child while I was there. I had a late in life baby, a son, and I needed a, a job that you know would actually help me to take care of myself. So I left and went to another nonprofit and that's where I'm working now. And it's nationally doing the same thing, protecting Medicaid for people who need it and trying to watch Medicaid laws, policy, doing policy on the Hill of DC and also you know, be doing litigation track whenever that's necessary in all 50 states. So essentially we provide technical support for legal aid offices all over the US. So that's the job I am now, I have now. Um, and I really, I'm learning so much every day. It's a challenge to me. But there was a part of my faith deconstruction journey that I hadn't gone through, and I didn't realize that. In doing one, in fading away and in filling my time, I felt as if I were on a mission, and my mission was to make up for lost time, make up for lost time. I'm already 10 years behind, I'm 12 years behind, I'm, you know, I've got to do this. And so that I was driven. So between that and raising my kids, that was like all of my focus. But what I hadn't done is to process my journey very well, right? I kind of pushed that off to the side and pushed it off. And I'd done enough research to know there was no way I was ever going back. There was like, there was, there were so many things that just weren't true. There were so many new light changes that just didn't make sense that were just defied, you know, reason and logic. But I had never 
process it the way I need it to. And, and one of the books that helped me is called Exiting the JW Cult. It's a healing handbook for current and former Jehovah's Witnesses by Bonnie Zeman, who was a counselor, who's a therapist now. And she wrote that and, and a former witness. And one of the things it said is that when people go through trauma, what they need is a psychological debriefing, right? They need to tell their story. If they're refugees, asylees, they've seen some horrible genocide, they need to tell their story. It is cathartic to them to find a way to do that. And the older I got, the more I realized I wanted to tell my story. Um, there wasn't really a way to do that because I remember um, I remember various, various times in my life, I would be interviewing and there's this huge block of time that doesn't make sense, <laughs> right? And I remember getting trying to get into law school and I had finessed it away, you know, explained it away because, you know, it doesn't really help you get accepted into law school or to get a good scholarship. Said I spent a lot of time in a cult. <laughs> I had to leave. So people were, they would either think I was younger than I was, but I had a, a the professor who interviewed me for law school said, but what were you doing during that time? And I was like, oh, you know, life got in the way. You know, it was like, because how do you explain that to somebody? There just isn't. And I didn't know how to process that and say it. It was all, so it was like the first 30 years of my life were just kind of a hidden experience. That, and they didn't understand my relationship with my parents had deteriorated. So first, when I started fading, they were trying to get us back to the truth. Um, and then I kind of, I share with them why I was not coming back to Jehovah and coming back to the truth. And so then I became a problem and I was relegated to my father was the only one that would communicate with me. As a matter of fact, since 2005, I haven't heard from anybody about, about my dad. And it's not really communication. It's an annual email telling me what I'm doing wrong and that um, he, our family can only be united when I return to Jehovah which means that they also cut ties with their um, granddaughter, my daughter, and they've never met my son, who'll be 12 this year. Never asked for a picture, never met him. It's just not a normal relationship. And I, I understand even less as a parent because I knew for me, having a parent was the time to start distancing myself from religious tenets or doctrines that would, that would in, um, impede on a familial relationship. But for them, it was just the opposite. They double down. And I understand now because they're in their 70s. So, you know, who wants to say, wow, I did this and it's cost me so dearly and it might not have been the right course. I think maybe there have to be some needles of doubt, um, but that's their journey. But for me, it became necessary to try to process what I had gone through, the person I was, the person I am now, and how I became that person. And so that's when I started to write and I had, I realized I had, and I, but I started to write authentically, right? And it helped me. So I started a blog, callmevashti.com. And I loved her because I didn't have many uh, feminine sheroes in the witness organization, but Vashti was the, you know, the queen who wouldn't come out when the king called her. The reason why she got you know removed and um, um, Esther became queen but I thought she was such a badass. <laughs> Even when I was a witness, I thought Vashti was. That's why I named my blog that, callmevashti.com. Um, and in doing that, I started to write my own story. I started to write, you know what? This is what it was like being a kid for me. This is what it was like being, you know, when I wanted to go to college and I couldn't. This is what race prejudice looked like for me. This is what it was like to be a woman in that organization. And to never feel like that you... It's not only that you, it's more than not being in leadership, right? It's not, it's not just that women, women can't, which is bad enough, because once some women should be in leadership, that they could never be elders or that they could never, um, you know, be on the writing committee. It was also the fact that their voices aren't heard. They're not recognized. The needs that they have aren't, they, the people in charge can't even understand their perspective so that. Even if so, even if you don't have a story of sexual abuse, right? Even if you've never been at a committee meeting, because I've never been at a committee meeting. I mean, if they call me, I wouldn't go, but I don't <laughs> I don't think they even know to do that. Even even if that hasn't happened, um you you still are um your autonomy is usurped whenever someone tells you about short skirts at the district convention. Um people, there's so much misogyny that's um, built into the witness organization. Like 
I, the thought process that if you are a woman and you have a baby and you teach your son how to read and you take care of them and you teach them everything they know, and let's say they decide to become 12 and get baptized, suddenly they're your spiritual head. You can't even pray without covering your head in front of them. I mean, how whacked is that, right? It was like all that process. So the best that you could hope for as a woman in the witness organization is a little um, condescension, right? But the best that you can hope for is a casual misogyny, right? The worst is that when women are powerless or voiceless, they're more likely to be subjects of abuse and they're less likely to be heard when they report that abuse, right? Which is why Barbara Anderson was so amazing because she was one of the ones that covered the rampant sexual abuse in the witness organization. And at the time, I don't think they hadn't been sued for it. So they could have, if they had listened to this strong, powerful, smart woman who found the records, knew what was going on, they may have saved themselves millions of dollars and a lot of, you know, a lot of problems. But why would they listen? That's a woman. She's the problem for bringing it to their attention. Anyway, those are the things that I had to process. Um, and so the other thing that I did is, you know, I think part of faith deconstruction is, you know, taking apart a belief system piece by piece, figuring out, is this based in objective fact? Does this hurt or harm me? Does it fit, fit or align with my values? That's not something that I could ever do as a witness. I couldn't have done that, A, because that's independent thinking, which is a pejorative, only in, <laughs> in high control religion. Anywhere else, being an independent thinker is kind of a skill set. Um, but the other thing is because where do you, where, do, where does questioning like that get you? What's the end result? And the end result is you lose absolutely everything. You lose your community. You lose your support structure. It's almost as if believe the way we do because it's the most wonderful, you know, a belief system in the world. And if you don't, then your parents and family will never speak to you again. <laughs> and that's a huge price. So why would you do a critical analysis of your faith, right? There's no impetus to do that. It could only be a downside. That, and there were other experiences too. I remember as a teenager, there was a, a, a child in the congregation who developed a rare eye disorder, needed a blood transfusion. And basically she became a martyr and she died. And they talked about what a really great, great um, example that she was. You know, what a wonderful thing that she had done, this 18 year old child who died when she didn't have to, right? And then only to find that they're not even teaching the same religion, the same concepts about blood transfusion when they're trying to get a, um, a religious exemption in Europe, in places in Europe. So that was mind boggling to me. And the other thing that brought that home is my my brother's daughter, her, his oldest child, who had leukemia when she was first born. She was an infant. And it was a big shot for my family because that was one of the, because she was just a few months old when she absolutely had to have blood transfusion. They took away custody and they gave her the blood transfusion. And I remember being, I, I went to be with my parents when that happened. And my thoughts were that I had had, a, I had a daughter too. And my mom said, when she found out they took custody, they're going to give her the transfusion. She yelled into the phone. They should have just let her die. I wish they'd let her die. And I'm holding my daughter thinking, shit on that. Like, if this happens to my can I say that? I was like, but she's having it. Like, I'm not going to sacrifice my kid. Who would do that? And I would hope I wouldn't have even let, you know, I wouldn't have lost time letting a court order get decided. And I thought that's, it's almost as if everything that I was afraid to challenge for myself when I became a parent, it became like the easiest thing in the world to see this is too much. I'm not going to let someone else usurp my parental role and care for my child. I'm going to do it. So, I like to think that becoming a parent is the best thing that ever happened to me because it helped me grow up and also helped me to find my own voice. Anyway, um, 2020 happened and that was a pivotal year for me because I finally had, you know, between career, now I'm a single mom and all of these things that I had to do, paying bills and keeping up with stuff. But 2020 let me stop and take a break. So all of the stories and all of the things that I had been writing kind of came together and I got to write a novel, and it's called Sunless and Silent and Deep. And the reason this is so cathartic for me, it's available on Amazon and you know, Barnes and Noble. Um, but the reason it's cathartic, because I wrote a, a novel about a fundamentalist religious uh, insular group in rural North Carolina, where 
when a woman marries, she's required to take a vow of silence and to never speak outside of her home and only to her husband and children. And it's about um, a biracial girl who um, her mom converted after, you know, she was a single parent. So she's the only uh, BIPOC member of this, you know, white community. And it's about her experiences and her cognitive dissonance as figure, she figures out whether this religious group, their tenets suit her. But it's also this Black social worker who wants to help the girl, Kara Grace, to find her own voice and to decide whether she wants to be a member of that religious community. And it's about other women in that community, too, who have their own reasons for being there. So that was an amazing experience for me. Because one of the things I had to do in order to create the novel is to create a religion, right? I had to create it. So I had to do a backstory for it. So I had to write the tenets of the religion. I did like a wiki page for the religion. I did um, even wrote a hymn, even though I don't write music. Um, I wrote that for it. And it was like, this is to try to understand how a belief system could trickle down and impact people with so many unintended consequences and how it could be so detrimental on a group of women. That's what my book is really about. And that was in writing about that story, I was writing about myself and my own journey. So that was fun to do. Oh my gosh, Miriam, what a story. I, I'm like captivated by so many parts. You are such a fantastic storyteller and ridiculously empowering for women of all backgrounds the fact that you were in college at 40 I mean come on <laughs> it, it, it speaks so highly of what you can achieve and not listening to what people tell you to do and you were you were in your own path and you had nobody supporting you you were supporting yourself which was amazing you were finding these new women in the educational system that were kind of like your role models and you were looking up to them and the fact that you said that you were going to give the awake magazine to a teacher and you put it back what a story um thank you so much for sharing your story i know a lot of people are just going to be blown away by what you're sharing with that being said do you feel like you missed out on anything that you would love to share i'm going to leave all of the links to your book and to your social media and to your um your blog, obviously, in the description box for people that would want to see you. But if there's anything that you feel like you would like to add to this interview that you feel like you missed out, go ahead. Um, I just want to have a message to anyone who's PIMO, right? You're physically and mentally out, that there is a way forward, right? And there's a life after that. Um, I also want to talk to anyone who's recently left the organization because I know that's such a hard thing you don't feel empowered when it first happens, right? No one would if you lost your entire community, you lost your support system. In many instances, you've lost your family. Um, take time for yourself and heal yourself to own your own experience and try to understand it. Get therapy because it helped me a lot along the way. But also there's this thing called post-traumatic growth, right? Um, I, it's so easy to get bogged down in, I didn't get to go to college when I was 18. That was a screwy, horrible decision. It's like, you're alive, right? If you have breath, then you have time. You want to write a book, do it. You want to go to college and get an education and get it and do it. To be honest, when I stop this working thing, I plan to get like three more degrees just for me, just because I'll audit classes until I'm 80 years old, because I have so many things I want to know, right? So many things that I want to do. So it's never too late. Whatever age you wake up, that's your age. That's your experience. And also, all of it isn't terrible. Some really bad parts. But you know what? You can build on that because the thing, believe me, I learned how to handle a, you know, a, a to de-escalate a householder when you're there and they don't want you there. <laughs> Turns out that's really good if you're in management too. <laughs> there are some things that are part of your story that you can just own, right? Um, I figure my life story is one of the few things that I own outright. <laughs> so I get to share that. And when you do, it resonates with other people, um, even people that you may not even know, it resonates with them. So, you know, own your journey, um, take stock of where you are now, and you can get to where you want to be. Just have the determination and effort and drive. I love it. Could not agree with you anymore. So thank you again for coming on my channel and thank you for watching this video.